Welcome back to part three of lesson 11 in engaging scripture. We're continuing to talk about New Testament epistles. In this lesson, or in, in part three of this lesson, I want to dig into one particular passage of scripture. We're going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and look at verses 1 through 8. And um, we're going to use that passage to uh, to apply some of the things that we've been learning uh, about Bible study, observation, interpretation, application. And really, I'm just going to walk through the passage with you and highlight a few things, uh, show you uh, some how to make connections uh, with um, you know, some of the significant words that Paul uses and, and really just how I would go about studying uh, a passage like this. And so that's what we're going to do in, in this lesson or in, in this part of Lesson 11. Uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So I invite you to take out your Bible. If you have it along, I'll have the words on the screen as well. And uh, let's jump right into it. Starting in verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask you, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through our Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord, the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, let, let's just pause and pray a minute as we dig into this passage. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us as we, as we open this word together, as we study it, even in, in a, a brief manner here. Uh, Father, I pray that you would open our eyes to see what you have for us in this text. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so read through the passage. Um, that's what you obviously want to do when you want to study the Bible. That makes sense. Uh, the first thing I want to note is this. Remember who Paul's writing to. And um, uh, kind of touched on this in that introduction I read to you uh, a moment ago, but the, the Thessalonian church was largely made up of Gentile converts to Christianity. And so um, Paul had gone to Thessalonica. He had reasoned in the synagogue. A few of the Jews had believed, but were told specifically that a large number of Gentiles uh, followed him. So remembering that, that Paul is speaking primarily to a Gentile audience. And then as you turn to 1 Thessalonians, you see in verse 9 of chapter 1 that Paul specifically says, um, he, he's encouraging them, and he says, um, we, we, we hear how you've turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So obviously he's t talking to uh, largely Gentiles, Gentile converts to Christianity. Now here's my question. In light of that insight, why do you think Paul would focus on sexual immorality as one of his primary teaching points in the letter? <clears throat> um, really in First Thessalonians, uh, there are two main topics in terms of teaching. Paul writes a lot at the beginning about his personal experience um, with them, uh, his being, <clears throat> as we saw, being uh, drug away and him wanting to return. So there's a lot of personal interaction, actually, in the first uh, two chapters, uh, first two, two and a half chapters um, uh, of the letter. Paul is, is, is uh, speaking about their, um, his connection with this church. And so we really only have two major teaching points in First Thessalonians, one about sexual immorality, and then a large section about return of Christ and uh, some co concerns there. So out of all the things that Paul could have written to this church about, why, why does he choose sexual immorality as one of his main, um, main concerns for teaching? Well, think about... Um, the, the Gentile audience that he's writing to. It's helpful to know that the Roman world, the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day, was a sex-saturated society. And um, 
this is, uh, yeah, I think you can just use this as general knowledge as you're reading the New Testament. Um, the, the Roman world, uh, the pagan, pagan worship, the, 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 the Roman um, pantheon of gods, a, a lot of the worship of these false gods revolved around sexual morality. Uh, and so um, I just put this explanation here. Before coming to Christ, many of Paul's Gentile converts had been accustomed to the low moral standards of their day. Um, among Greeks and Romans, sexual purity and chastity was not highly valued. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a value in that culture. To add to this moral depravity, the worship of pagan gods often involved immoral sexual practices. There were prostitutes in the temples that were part of the, 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 the worship of these false gods. And so it's for this reason that when the apostles sought to lay down guidelines for including the Gentiles in the church, one of the main points was a call to sexual purity. And we can see this in Acts 15. One of, the, one of the key points was a call to sexual purity because of this heavy influence of immorality in that day and age. And it had to do with worship. It had to do with uh, just the low standards yeah, that, that Greeks and Romans had in terms of purity. And so, of course, that's going to be a major concern in the New Testament. We see that come out here in Thessalonians. So you say, well, how am I supposed to just know that? Because, um, you know, we're not told that uh, in, in, you know, this particular passage pass of scripture itself. Paul's not saying, hey, by the way, because of the low, low standards or because of temple prostitution or whatever it is. So how are you supposed to know this? Well, again, consulting a study Bible can be really helpful. I just put up a note here from my ESV study Bible on this passage, uh, verse 3. This is what it says. Paul commands the Thessalonians to live in sexual holiness. Some converts may have found it a struggle to adjust to Christianity's demanding, excuse me, demanding ethical code because, as former pagans, the lure of sexual sin was strong. So that doesn't really expand on everything that I shared with you. Um, but I think you can just kind of consider that general knowledge, general background information, that the world that Paul was writing in the secular world of that day was highly sexualized and uh, there was a lot of immorality. And that's why you see um, Paul and other New Testament writers addressing this, this uh, particular area quite a bit because it was a huge struggle. And, and so you have Christians who are converts, uh, Christian converts uh, who were, were, they didn't have the Bible as their background. They were Gentiles. They came out of this pagan lifestyle. And, uh, you know, maybe for years they had thought this is perfectly okay. And now they're Christians and, and God is calling them to live differently and to really live in a countercultural kind of way. And so, of course, this is going to be a, a big emphasis in teaching when Paul is addressing a primarily Gentile audience. Okay, so, um, so that's the first thing to know. Why is this topic uh, one that Paul digs into? It's because of who he's writing to and, and their background. All right, now I want to do something a little bit different. So um, instead of trying to put all of these points up on the screen, I, I just want to walk through the passage with you. I haven't done this in a video before, so, so bear with me. I'm going to turn off my video so that you can just see the passage. And um, I'm gonna highlight some things as we, as we read together. So if, if we were gonna study this passage, just walk through. Um, you would expect the topic sentence to be at the beginning because that's typically how we write. So what does Paul say? Finally, brothers, finally, um, probably means that Paul is shifting gears. Um, he, he's going to another topic from what he'd been talking about previously. Uh, finally, brothers, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. So let me pull up my highlighter pen here. Um, so we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus um, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk to please God. Uh, 
that you do so more and more. So what, what is Paul getting at in this passage? Uh, he's, he's urging them to walk to please God. And he says, you're doing this already. But I encourage you, I, I urge you, I plead with you to do it more and more. Okay, so that's the, that's the first sentence there in, in the paragraph. How does he follow it up? Verse two, four, here's a good connecting word, four. So Paul is maybe going to explain what he just said in a little bit more detail. Four, here's the reason. You know the instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Now let's pause for a moment. Two times, Paul, let me, let's change the color of the pen here. Um, Two times Paul has mentioned the Lord Jesus, here and here. So that's a little bit of repetition. Um, we urge you in the Lord Jesus. And now he says, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, through the Lord Jesus. What is Paul doing? He's, he's telling us that, that what he is saying here, this is not Paul's good advice. Um, Paul is not just saying, here's what I think about, um, uh, about uh, sexual purity and, and immorality. Here's some thoughts that I have on this issue. No, he's saying we urge you in Christ. And we, we taught you uh, instructions that we gave you through the Lord Jesus. And so Paul is saying, uh, what I'm about to say is coming not from me, but really coming from Christ. And we'll see this at the end, well, let's just jump there. Look down at verse 7 and 8. Uh, God has not called us for impurity, but holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God. Where do these instructions come from? They come from God. Uh, so Paul is emphasizing here that this teaching is not just wisdom, um, you know, good bits of wisdom. It's not just good advice, but these instructions are actually from God. This is what God wants of his people. Uh, so that is uh, one thing that we notice in this passage. Paul is, is um, sort of emphasizing the authority of Christ in this matter of sexual purity. Okay, and, and he's urging them to to live in a way to please God, just as they are doing, but, but to do it more and more. Okay, verse three. For, here's another connecting word, for. Uh, so because of these things, because we've taught you this, we, we're, uh, God is calling you to live in a manner to please him. Um, uh, Christ gave you these instructions. For, here's another reason or a ground. This is the will of God your sanctification. Now, I'm just going to say um, that, uh, that this, to me, seems to be, um, we'll just cut it off there, sanctification. This seems to be the primary idea that Paul is getting at in this passage, uh, living to please God. Uh, and then he comes out more clearly here in verse three. This is God's will. This is God's will for your life, your sanctification, that you would grow in holiness and honor uh, of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so that's the, that's the main idea of this passage, your sanctification. This is God's will for you, that you would live a life to please God. Okay, now how does he go on to explain that? That includes abstaining from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in passion and lust like the Gentiles. So remember we talked about the, the Gentiles, that background of, of living in this culture that had low, low standards, low morals. Don't live in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. And that no one transgress his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger of all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Um, so notice how Paul expands on this idea of sanctification. 
In fact, there's a key word, uh, a connecting word that's repeated. Uh, sorry, I'm going to get, I'm going to make the screen a little bit. It's going to get overwhelming all of these colors, but that's okay. Uh, notice a key word that's repeated a few times that, 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 shows us how Paul is expanding on this general idea of sanctification. God's will for your life is sanctification, that you would walk in a way that pleases him. In what way? One, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now notice verse four, that appears again, that, that each of you would know how to control his own body. Um, and then again in verse six, that no one transgress his brother in this matter. What is Paul doing? He's, he's laying out in a, a, logical, a, a logical sequence of, of points that follow from this first point. This is God's will for your life, sanctification. And he expands on, upon that in three ways. Now, I'm going to come back to this and all my writing is going to be gone. But you could lay it out like this. Look at how, how Paul's argument just sort of flows naturally. This is God's will for your life, your sanctification. That includes three things. It includes abstaining from sexual immorality. And furthermore, that includes knowing how to control your own body in holiness and honor. So abstaining from sexual immorality, what you should not do. Also, what you should do, use your body in holiness and honor. And then he, he kind of explains that a little bit more, not in the passion of lust like Gentiles who don't know God. So what is he saying here? That, that you should know how to control your body, not like the heathens, not like people who don't know God, but because you know God, because you know Christ, that you should use your body in a way that honors him and is expressed in holiness. So abstaining from sin turning to God in holiness and honor. And then thirdly, that you not transgress your or wrong your brother in this matter. What does um, sexual immorality do? Does it hurt a brother? Well, yes, it does. Because if you're in engaging in this behavior with uh, somebody who's not your spouse, then yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know if temple prostitutes were... Uh, were married or not. Maybe that was their profession. Um, so you would, be, you would be wronging another person by engaging in this behavior with somebody else's spouse, right? So, so there's, there's, this, um, there's this not just a God word, uh, you know, concern, but also a, a, a horizontal concern between, between human beings, between people. That, that somehow in engaging in this, um, this immorality, that we're not only offending God, but we're offending uh, and, and harming uh, another brother or sister uh, in, in the Lord. And so, so you see, Paul has three different concerns. God calls us to sanctification. That means abstaining from, from immorality. It means uh, positively living and using our bodies to honor Christ and also uh, positively using our, our, our bodies or not using them in a way that would harm another person who's made in the image of God. And we could probably uh, expand upon that even more. Okay. So we see how, how Paul is laying out in a very, um, very logical way, this argument this is what God, God's will is, God's desire for your life. Let's just highlight that again. God's desire for your life, God's will for your life is your sanctification. And, and then in a very uh, orderly way, Paul lays out three reasons why uh, that, that is God's will, or three, three implications of that that flow from it, all relating to sexual immorality. Okay. And then in verse 7, so we kind of looked at verses 1 through 6. I guess we didn't address this part because here's another, um, here's another connecting word. Let's do a different color here. Uh, because, 
So uh, because gives us a reason, um, a, a grounding. Why should we care about these things? Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we told you and, and solemnly warned you. Um, I think perhaps what Paul is saying is that, you know, God's going to hold us accountable. Uh, we're we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday. And, and God is, God cares about how we live. And because the Lord is an avenger in these things, uh, we warned you. And so then verse seven, he, he spells that out more again for, here's a connecting word. So, so um, let's just do it this way because, so this is kind of the outflow of, of all of these things that, that, that Paul, excuse my, I didn't make the circle big enough. All of these things that follow from, from verses three through five, um, because of that, you need to know that the Lord's an avenger. And then also, you know, following that up, Paul says, for God has not called us for impurity, but for holiness. And so again, we, we see, uh, we see this concern for holiness, um, which has to do with sanctification, which has to do with walking in a way that pleases God. And so you see how that thought follows all the way through, all the way through the passage. God has not called us for impurity, but holiness. So that's kind of his conclusion, right? For, here's the conclusion. God hasn't called us to live in sexual immorality. Uh, God hasn't called us to uh, live in a way that, uh, you know, we do whatever we want with our bodies. No, God called us to live in purity. And that includes this uh, huge area of our lives, our, 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 our sexual purity and how we, how we use our bodies. God has not called us to live in impurity, but because of Christ, he calls us to live in holiness Therefore, and here's his conclusion, therefore, right? There's another connecting word. Let's change that up. Um, here we go. Here's his final conclusion. Therefore, whoever disregards this doesn't disregard man, but God, who gives us his Holy Spirit. So uh, walking through that passage together, we see how paying attention to key words, um, sanctification, holiness, uh, holiness appears here too. Uh, we see how we can, we can grasp what Paul is teaching in this passage by following, uh, by following his lines of reasoning. And he kind of alludes to it here in the first sentence. I would say that the topic sentence is verse three, the first part of verse three. This is God's will, your sanctification. And the whole rest of the paragraph just unpacks that. And he does it in a very specific way. Your sanctification, which includes sexual immorality. Um, let's see. Talked about that. Okay, so, so we've, we've dug into the passage. Uh, we, we've made some ob observations. Uh, we've interpreted that. Um, we understand that part of the reason Paul is talking about sexual immorality is because of the background uh, of Thessalonians, um, the, these many Gentile converts coming out of paganism um, that, that Paul needs to address this important area. So now that we've observed, we've interpreted, now we can do some application. And so I just have a couple of questions here we'll talk through. Uh, in what way is the world of the Thessalonians different than ours? Well, you know, we don't live in a world, at least in our country, where there are pagan temples. Um, here, let me, I'll come back. Here we go. Now you can see me again. Uh, we don't live in a, a, a day and age where there are pagan temples that, um, you know, where there's temple prostitutes and that sort of thing. So, so we live in a very different world. And yet, 
uh, it's true that we also live in a highly sexualized culture. So there's a lot of similarity, actually, even though our situations are very different than, uh, than the Thessalonian church. Uh, actually, we share a lot in common with them because uh, we live in a culture that is highly sexualized as well. And so that means that Paul's teaching in First Thessalonians is actually very relevant for, for us today because we, we face the same kinds of struggles, even though they take different shapes, uh, different forms. Uh, God's word to the Thessalonian church is really the same word that he has for us, that, that God would speak into our world today. Uh, so it's very relevant. So this teaching on purity applies not just in the first century, it applies to us today. And so we need to heed Paul's words. Well, not Paul's words. Remember, he says it's God's word. If you ignore this, you're not ignoring man. You're not ignoring Paul. You're ignoring God. God's will for your life, for my life, is our sanctification. God wants us to grow in holiness and honor to more and more reflect Christ in the way that we live. Now, here's another follow-up question. Does God's desire for our sanctification include more than our sexual ethics? Is that the only application uh, from this passage? Paul is specifically addressing uh, sexuality. Well, isn't the principle uh, itself, um, doesn't that apply to a lot of different areas of life? God's will is your sanctification. Is the only area of, of your life that needs sanctification your, 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 um, your sexuality, your sexual, uh, sexual life? I don't think that's the right phrase, but you know what I mean. Um, your, your, your sexual purity? Is that the only area of life in which we need to be sanctified? Um, does, does, do we not need sanctification when it comes to how we use our finances, uh, how we speak and act, how we treat other people. Uh, there's all kinds of areas in, in, which, um, in, in which we need the Holy Spirit to be at work sanctifying us and uh, bringing us to uh, a more Christ-like uh, way of living. And so then the truth of this passage really applies to many areas. We can apply this truth to all kinds of different uh, spheres of, of life. And so you say, you know, I'm, I'm reading First Thessalonians 4. Maybe you come to this in your devotions and you say, you know, I, I'm, uh, praise the Lord. I, I'm just not really struggling in the area of sexuality. I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I'm living a, a fairly, um, fairly moral and obedient life in, in this regard. This is not my area of struggle right? And so you come to that passage and you think, why? Well, I guess I can just skip over it because it doesn't really speak to my struggles. Well, wait a minute. What, what is Paul really getting at? Isn't the main idea of the passage that you would live in a way that pleases God, that, uh, that, that you would live in ho holiness and honor because God's will for your life is sanctification? So then an entirely appropriate application of this passage would be to ask, well, what areas of my life am I not living in holiness and honor? Are, are there areas of my life that I'm not using my body or my mind or my resources to honor and glorify Jesus? And, and so even though, you know, you're applying uh, the truth of this passage to a different area of, of life, um, uh, doesn't mean that, uh, or let me say this a different way, the, 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 the truth of the passage uh, applies not just to this one area. This is just one example of an area where we need to be sanctified and one that Paul specifically needed to address in this context. But that doesn't mean it doesn't apply to the other areas of our life. And so uh, we take the general principle, the truth that we find in this passage that, that God calls us to walk in a way to please him because his will for our life is sanctification. Um, so we might ask, what do I need to avoid? Uh, maybe it's not sexual immorality. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm living obediently in that area of my life, but, but is there something in my life that I need to avoid um, because it's leading me to, to live in a way that doesn't please God? Um, what does it look like to 
put on, right? So there's the, the taking off, there's the, there's the removing or avoiding sinful behavior. What is, the, what is the thing that God is calling me to do instead in a positive way? Uh, how could I use my mind or body or resources, wh whatever it is that relates to that area of sin in your life? That, how could I use that in a way that is holy and honors Jesus? And um, how does my area of sin or struggle um, that I need to be sanctified in, you know, maybe there's an area where this is harming other people. Uh, just like Paul says, don't, don't, um, uh, don't transgress or wrong your brother. Uh, consider how the area of struggle that you're facing might be wronging another believer or even an unbeliever because you're living in disobedience. You're not living in holiness and purity um, to Christ. And so we can take the truth of the passage and begin to apply it in, in a lot of different ways. And so in, in that sense, the word of God to them, again, is still the word of God to us today. It might take a different shape in terms of application, but the truth is exactly the same. God calls us to live in holiness. God calls us to live lives that are pure, that reflect Jesus. And, and, and so uh, we might have a sin to confess. Uh, we, might have, um, uh, we might have a reason to give thanks to God uh, because we have experienced victory. Uh, we might have a prayer that God would make us more and more like Jesus as a result of reading this passage. So uh, that's just, a, I don't know how brief that was or not, but um, that, that's uh, just an example of how we can dig into the epistles and um, how you can follow those key words to, to dig into and pull out the meaning of the passage. What is it saying and what does it mean? And then what is the, what is the truth that's there that applies not just in the first century, um, but, but how does it apply to my life today? And, and everything that we've talked about here is completely consistent with the teaching of this passage. We haven't read any meaning into it. We've simply pulled the meaning out through observation, through interpretation, and then applying those truths of God's word to, to our lives. So um, uh, that's a, a brief overview on studying epistles. I'm going to come back in video 11.5, lesson 11.5, and talk about one more thing with the epistles that can be really helpful in helping you to dig into uh, the, you know, finding the, the, the uh, theme or the focus of the New Testament letters. So, so come back and join me for that video. And let me just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, that uh, you speak through it. And I pray that even in this brief study, uh, that, that we would be challenged to not only love your word more, but Father, that we would be challenged to dig into it so that we can listen to what you say and, and how you want us to live all for the sake of Jesus and for his glory. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you guys for watching, and we will see you very shortly uh, with uh, video lesson 11.5. I hope to see you there. Thanks.